joint discussion here between the Gridwise members and our panel participants here um, to talk about how we can all support state, local, and tribal implementation of the billions of dollars that are going to flow um, through to or through those entities for um, grid modernization. So the way this is going to run is um, I really want this to be an interactive um, discussion. So uh, we've got... Um, um, some people from the um, Department of Energy. We have some um, folks who are um, either associated with or part of state governments. And they're each going to say a few um, remarks. We're going to start with um, a uh, presentation from Kirsten Verklaas of NASIO just to lay out all the money that's going to the, the you know, subnational governments and where it's coming and what it's for. So just so you have it in your head, because I think that even those of us who are really well immersed in the infrastructure bill uh, often don't fully grasp the scope and the scale of the money that's moving. And so after Kirsten, I will open it up for a few questions, and then we'll um, start with a federal agency perspective and open it up for a few questions, and then go to the state uh, perspective, open it up for a few questions. And then, but these questions, I'm hoping these questions um, are going to be more than just the questions that you would be able to get um, either through our Grid Investments Task Force about what, what's the date, what's the amount of money that, you know, that you're sort of asking questions about what we can all do to support this implementation. And then at the, um, after we hear from the federal and state perspectives, we're going to um, have a sort of an audience um, uh, Q&A. Um, presentations back to this panel about things that our members are doing to get ready for, um, for the funding, whether you're um, developing your own programs and your own partnerships, whether you're developing templates, whether you're thinking about how you reach out to uh, entities that might be eligible applicants but that have you know, low resources. And that's going to be a conversation moderated by Mona Seth of Schneider Electric and Mark Thompson of National Grid. So let's start um, with Kirsten, and she can walk us through um, all of the money that's available to the states and locals. Thank you so much, Karen, and thank you so much um, for inviting um, me and Nazia to be part of this, and I will uh, attempt to walk you all through some of the money that's available, because clearly the IIJ in particular is enormous, and there's enormous amounts of money, which is uh, slightly terrifying, but very exciting, too. Um, just quickly about NASIO, we are the um, only nonprofit association for the governor designated energy officials. Um, we have one of our members, David Bobzian, on the panel today. Um, and we serve as resources for the state energy offices, um, and we also represent their interests in Congress. And the state energy offices really um, do a wide variety of energy policy across the states. We have members that range from very large, like the California Energy Commission um, and NYSERDA, to rather small three people um, energy offices. And they sit in different agencies. Some of them are standalone, um, and some of them sit in economic development agencies, um, you know, State Department of Commerce, um, environmental protection agencies, and so on. So they're very, very varied across the states. And we have a number of programs and priorities. Um, buildings, electricity, um, finance, those are all led by committees um, made up of our members, transportation, and then we have some cross-cutting issues like resilience, like equity, um, that span sort of all of these programs. But I wanted to really get quickly into the, the heart of the matter. Um, and so the key overall state and local energy opportunities, these are opportunities um, for the states and local governments that kind of span across a lot of different energy policy areas. So first and foremost, the U.S. State Energy Program. Um, there's 500 million formula funding that goes to directly to the state energy offices. Um, this, these applications were actually just due yesterday. Um, so the states have been working on applications for that. Um, and then that money will flow through the state energy offices um, to the states. The Weatherization Assistance Program is another um, large formula funding to the states. Um, we also have the Energy Efficiency and Conservation Block Grants, um, another large um, funding opportunity for the state of energy offices, and a lot of these are formula funds. Um, and then we have the, um, the Energy Efficiency Revolving Loan um, funds that are also going to the um, state energy offices. And a lot of these um, are in the process right now. I've just put in the notes real quick. I'm not going to go through it, but where we are in, in the process, and a lot of these are either um, the ALRD or the, 
the grant program applications have been issued or the process of being issued or the states are in the process of um, applying for these. And especially stressing the um, SCP program, I think, is a, is a tremendous chance for the state energy offices to use some of this funding to support their programs. All, all of them um, use the SEP program to support staff, to support their programs, um, and so this is a great influx of, of funding for them. I want to note um, on the SEP program, too, that there's a, a new mandatory provision for the state energy office, which I think is interesting. They're now required um, to look and support transmission and distribution planning. So that's something that they haven't done in the past, um, but it's something that's now mandatory. Under SCP, mandatory is a little bit different than normal mandatory. For example, state energy offices are mandatorily required to support turning right on red, which probably you didn't know. Um, so that's, you know, you can probably um, uh, respond to these mandatory items in, in a different way, but I think it's important to stress that that is in there. There's also transportation provisions in the IAJ. Of course, you know, um, the one that the NASIO members are particularly engaged on is the NEVI program, the National EV Formula Program. We have a joint program um, with AASHTO, which Dave is gonna talk about, um, and the joint office to support the state energy offices and the state departments of transportation on this. Um, the NEVI plans have all been in, they've been approved, and so now the state energy offices and the DOTs are looking to implement. And the state energy offices in particular have a really great experience with the VW settlement funds. They were instrumental in dispersing those. And so and that's why we're bringing them together with the State Department on Transportation to really learn from that experience and support some of the things that, that the states have already implemented um, in terms of EV infrastructure. There's also a few broadband provisions in the IJ. I just included that because I think it's important to connect the dots between energy and, and broadband. I'm not a broadband expert whatsoever, so please don't ask me any questions about this particular slide. Um, I think I will say that I think um, there's still a lot of, of uh, coordination that needs to happen on this particular kind of intersection between broadband and um, or communications and, and energy. Um, so it, it'll be interesting, I think, to see how the states are thinking about um, sort of the cross-cutting issues that are included in some of the IJA provisions. Really, the, the, key, the key provisions I work on are the State Energy Secure, Security Plan provisions, that's IJH section 4108. And I think as, if you're working on grid resilience in particular, this is really a section to note because it outlines sort of the requirements of what the state energy security plans need to look like. State energy security planning is not new. We have known it as state energy assurance planning. This was part of ARA in 2012-13. Some states have, um, you know, continued to update their plans. Um, others, the plans are a little bit older and, and you know, from 2012-2013. Um, but all states, and spe especially the state energy offices are very familiar with state energy planning, uh, security planning. And, um, but it's to note that for, for the IIJ section really kind of outlines that the state plans, energy security plans need to have um, a risk assessment. They need to talk about ha hazards and threats. And they need to outline kind of how states will address this. So some of the mitigation e efforts. And if you look at some of the provisions on grid resilience that are in the IIJA and some of the FOAs that DOE has put out, there's clearly a desire that the state energy security plans and that risk assessment on those mitigation measures play and are the foundation for some of the grid resilience investments by the private sector as well as the state sector. So if you then look at the electric system resilience provision 4101D, is the formula funds that is going to the states. Um, we have been sort of informally tracking which state agencies are receiving or are going to apply. The governor has to designate that in each state. Um, and in most states, it'll be probably the state energy offices. We have some states where it's the um, state uh, emergency agency and some states have you know, selected the PUC or other agencies. And then the GRIP program, and, and for that, the 4101D, the deadline is in March, and I, I will talk a little bit about how the states are approaching that in a minute. And then the GRIP program for was released in November. There's different dates for the concept paper, um, but there's different topics, 4101D, 4103B, 4107. I'll let DOE talk about all that. I'm sure they will. <laughs> 
So how are states approaching um, 4101D? So as I mentioned, the states are um, designating elite agencies and they're uh, required to set up objectives and metrics. Um, so I mentioned the tie-in to state energy security plans, understanding what the hazards, risks, and threats are, and then what kind of mitigation efforts um, and, and investments might be important. Most states, I think, encouraged by DOE are establishing really broad objectives out of desire to have this um, be a program narrative and a program that applies um, going forward for all five years and not having to change course you know, every year. I think there is a, uh, some states are choosing a hazard specific focus, for example, wildfires or hurricanes. Um, there's also a focus on wool and, and small utilities as part of, of the law. And then um, the kind of question I think that most states are wrestling with is some of the metrics to use. Obviously there's SADI and SAFI, um, but there's kind of a question of what, how do we measure these investments? What is, makes most sense to measure resilience investments? And then um, most states are, are looking at having a competitive um, grant program. Um, the eligible activities are part of the IAJA. There was a little bit of back and forth on uh, generation eligibility um, and the last men amendment um, from DOE has now um, mm -hmm. clarified that it's not part of the program. So the microgrids are, but you can't support any kind of electric generation, even if it's part of a microgrid. And then um, there's an, a public hearings and outreach components. So lots of states have approached the utilities, have approached the private sector, have um, set up advisory committees and really tried to figure out how is this best served um, and what kind of needs are in the private sector because those are the ultimate um, eligible entities. Um, and I'm also I will say that I think the states and everybody is still kind of wrestling with the fact of what ultimately the roles and responsibility will, will be. What is the roles of a state energy office that is setting up the grant program? What is the role of the PUC that looks at and oversees an IOU and their cost chair? Um, what are some of, of how, how does this all work and how does this all fit together? And especially kind of when you're then looping in the GRIP program as, as another part of resilience planning and funding. I will say that I think um, this is what I kind of have been hearing from the states in, in technical support needs. Um, there's specific technical assistance, which is, you know, metrics and objectives. Again, I mentioned, yes, Sadie Safi we're familiar with, but like how do we non-traditionally measure resilience and metrics, um, especially equity metrics too. What are some of the analysis needs? How do we measure and understand the impact of climate change, especially on a state and local level? And what are some of the cross-sector interdependencies, the natural gas, electric interdependencies? I mentioned the uh, communications energy interdependencies, transportation energy interdependencies that are just growing. And then there are certainly state-specific or very specific 4101D related questions like the set aside for small util utilities, eligibility of activities, et cetera. And then I already alluded to, I think there's also a huge need to have um, a conversation about overall grid resilience planning and coordination. So what are the roles and responsibilities? How does this work with NAVI? How does this work with other of the IIJ uh, programs, um, exchanging best practices and understanding what kind of harmonization of requirements and metrics can, can be uh, made, especially with DOE assistance. And then I think also the, the last one, organizational support and increased staff, staff capabilities. I think the state agencies, not just the state energy offices, are wondering how do we organize ourselves? What kind of workforce do we need? Um, and what are some of the implications of, of other programs like SCP's transmission and distribution planning? We've never done this. How do we you know, now take this into our portfolio? And then the, the uh, local and state coordination, I think um, not just on the state level, but also on the local level, there's a huge kind of need to understand this and also you know, staff up and, and, and have more capabilities on the staff level. And with that, I'm open for questions or <laughs> well, turn over to I'll Karen. Do, I think what I'll do is if, if we could just, um, since you gave a big perspective on the federal funding streams, but not all of them, to, why don't we just go to the DOE folks and then we'll open the floor for questions. So um, Courtney Haynes is with the Office of Clean Energy Demonstrations at DOE. Thank you. Thanks everybody. It's great to be here with you today. Hope you've had 
nice time the last day and a half. So as Karen said, my name is Courtney. I'm the stakeholder engagement lead for two provisions under the Office of Clean Energy Demonstrations with the U.S. Department of Energy. I'm actually coming over from U.S. Department of Commerce, where over the last year helped set up some of the American Rescue Plan funding um, and specifically worked in coal and rural communities. So very much have been on the ground all across the country and understanding the needs, um, the lack of capacity, but also the true potential. And energy seems to be the number one economic driver in these communities, as, as you know. So OSED is, is new. I know it's hard to kind of keep up with everything rolling out um, with the U.S. Department of Energy, but we are a new agency stood up with a bipartisan infrastructure law. We have about $25 billion right now to stand up in programming, and we are designing a number of provisions. The entire goal of OSED is to increase market adoption of technologies to move towards our climate goals. So it's kind of filling in a gap um, that currently doesn't exist after research and development and pilots, and now it's going into demonstrations and how do we really push progress and de-risk um, some of these technologies so that more capital can be invested. I, like I said, am the stakeholder lead on two provisions. One is the clean mine lands, um, and that one's $500 million. But I think really aligned with you all as members of Gridwise is the energy improvements in rural and remote communities. That's a billion dollars that we're currently in a design phase for. How we have been given a definition by Congress is serving any town um, or area of 10,000 inhabitants or less. And this is very broad. If you're familiar with OSED and if you know about some of our provisions, they're, they're very technical and, and honestly quite narrow as far as use when you're considering nuclear, industrial, hydro. But this energy improvement in rural and remote, it is quite broad as far as what it can be used for. So it is talking a lot about microgrids, updating electric facilities, thinking about grid modernization with a goal to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, reduce costs, and increase economic development potential of those localities. So I, I I'll try to keep it short because I realize there's a long line here <laughs> and then this is the end of the session, but I know, you know, the team asked three questions that hopefully could be helpful as far as working with you all. And one is, what are we thinking about when we're designing and implementing these programs? Um, we are very much trying to embrace stakeholder engagement as a very real, tangible, comprehensive way, um, looking at past experiences, understanding case studies to figure out, well, what are those factors that are most important? And the number one thing at OSED is obviously success. We want our investments to be successful. Two is sustainability. We want to ensure that there's long-term financing models and that we don't decommission any type of projects and that we're very aware of where these projects and programs are as far as concept to design to implementation to, to decommission, whatever it might be, but also give attention to the upgrading that might have to happen before any new technology can be implemented. And so really thinking about how is this going to work 10 years from now, 20 years from now, and back mapping our roadmaps and all of our resources. Three is being able to replicate. That's the whole point, right, of demonstrations. But when you're talking about rural communities, I, I'm from Southern West Virginia and actually was born in Eastern Kentucky, so they are my, my home and they're not alike. I mean, you can be talking about neighboring towns and they're very quite different um, for a lot of different reasons. And so how do you replicate these programs in these areas that are very different? And so we are thinking about what are those modular aspects of replication? How do you break it down smaller to think about coordination of players, to thinking about finance models, to thinking about diverse technologies? So we are trying to think about the ability to replicate in a way that is actually feasible. Then we're also thinking about collaboration and ensuring that the right stakeholders are really connected at the right time. And that is you know, we expect that for applicants or we hope to provide resources to give time and capacity for that partnership development. But we also realize on our side that's kind of 
we got to do that too, right? You know, we got to be a connector of players and plug in you all as stakeholders to those opportunities. And fifth is economic development. I think DOE is really pushing this idea of place-based economic development. And that, that's different. That's different stakeholders that are coming to the table to really have the, the buy-in. The next question they ask, well, what's needed to implement this money? And I would say from an external side, really specifics. Um, we are looking for not just kind of broad-based answers of what could happen, but what is happening. And so really understanding case studies and examples, what you all see every day, who your partners are, what your concerns are, opportunities, really, you know, bring that to us. We, we have to know. As an example, we have in our request for information as we're designing this program, you know, what do you think about the cost share? Right now with OSED, it's 50 percent. But there is an ability to waive that with the secretary if we have evidence. So often we'll say, well, small towns can't do that. And I was like, that's great. What can you do? You know, give me, a, give me a number, right? And so you all kind of informing us is so, so helpful. Then I would also say what's needed to implement the money is this partnership development and ensuring that there's capacity and resources. And then also with OSED, and if you're familiar, we push on this a lot, there is a um, community benefits plan. That's going to be part of our proposals, and it really is about ensuring that fourth and fifth thing I said prior is collaboration and ensuring economic development. So as you were talking about too, alignment to workforce, you know, really trying to understand who is going to benefit from these projects, what's the environmental implications as well. On the internal side, what we need to do to implement this money is we've got to get better coordinated, too. Um, there's a tremendous amount of money, as you all know. It's very hard to kind of keep up in real time with all the programs. There's real people working on these programs who are so excited, and they're standing up, you know, different forms of technical assistance and coordinations with labs and other entities, thinking about partnership intermediaries. Then outside of DOE, a lot of the other agencies, for example, Commerce has a lot of funding for broadband. Um, USDA has a lot of community partnerships and reach and access to networks, EDA, Commerce, Department of Interior. And so what's really needed to implement this funding in a comprehensive way is internally we are trying to work coordinated and understand what's happening, share information, stakeholder engagement results, RFI results, workshop results, and also try to roll out things in a way where it's not at the same time. So I know we, I know we, have, a, I know we have work to do there, and I can't kind of promise anything will happen, but there is kind of significant dedication that this, for this money to work in a way it has to be coordinated, both on the external side and internal with the government. And lastly, the third question was how we can work with you all. And for OSED, I can say you really already have, um, as Gridwise Alliance did submit an RFI for our program, which was very help helpful and valuable to how we're considering design and development long term for this program. There'll be multiple funding opportunity announcements. And just being here today and kind of introducing you to OSED and introducing you to this provision and myself, really the, op the door is open to learn from you all, understand those opportunities, what you're seeing. We've heard from you know, organizations and businesses about the need for greater flexibility, right, when we're designing these programs and thinking about an individual project model to an aggregator model and really kind of pushing the boundaries of what's possible. And so, again, understanding the reality, the case studies, your day to day is very, very helpful. And then I know you have access to these communities. Um, it's interesting to utilize GIS mapping with all these programs that are happening, right, and kind of understand what communities are lacking technical assistance and capacity building. And as we're rolling out supports and really trying to reach in these communities, would also ask, you know, you all to be a disseminator of that information to ensure that not only are we going to fund projects that might be shovel ready, but also that we're building a pipeline over the next couple of years and really getting communities and their stakeholders ready. 
So this is just a kind of quick graphic of how we are thinking about stakeholder engagement. So you can see all the folks we try to talk to, including yourselves, and how we want to iterate over time, refine our programming so that we can really meet the market and then hit on those five things I said. So I will pass it over to Dylan. I will say that um, we did submit our comments to you yesterday as I was sitting here at 1145. So just just 15 minutes before the door closed. I appreciate that. All right. Well, thank you. I don't think I submitted slides, so I'll probably just uh, just hop in here. So uh, hi, everyone. Dylan Reed. Uh, I lead external affairs for the grid deployment office, um, uh, overseeing kind of all of our external engagement uh, across all of our different divisions. I know our director, uh, Maria Robinson, uh, opened up yesterday. Uh, uh, the conference yesterday uh, and gave an overview of our office. So I won't repeat uh, too much of what she said, but I have noticed that in a lot of the uh, forums that we're speaking in, uh, that a lot of folks are still, uh, st we, we are capturing new, uh, uh, new people every time. So I do just want to quickly cover uh, kind of what, what uh, the grid deployment office does. Uh, and then offer some uh, some some overall uh, feedback on that. So, um, as I as I said, uh, we have three general uh, divisions uh, across the grid deployment office. We are new as a part of the the realignment, uh, as we're saying after the infrastructure law. Uh, the DOE tried to realign a number of our offices, Grid Deployment Office, Office of Clean Energy Demonstrations, other offices like the Loan Programs Office, to make sure that uh, DOE was focused uh, on uh, infrastructure deployment across all of these offices, whereas a number of offices that, that you are probably very aware, uh, aware of, of working over for many years are more focused on uh, research and development. So really within uh, kind of all how we're aligned within uh, uh, within DOE now is a number of offices all focusing on the infrastructure deployment side of things. So that's really uh, where GDO uh, fits, uh, fits within that. Uh, the three divisions uh, are, one, our power generation assistance division, which will probably be a little, of, a little less interest to the folks in the room that did want to cover it. Second is transmission division. And third is our grid modernization division, which is where I'll spend the bulk of, of time focusing on that. First one on power gen, that is uh, for, for folks that follow the civil nuclear credit program, which is a $6 billion program aimed uh, at uh, preventing the retirement of uh, nuclear power plants. Uh, we just had our first conditional award uh, announced uh, to Diablo Cannon uh, uh, last month uh, uh, now, uh, and we'll be moving forward with the second round here uh, soon. Uh, that also includes over $700 million in hydro incentives. For So for anyone working uh, with hydroelectric power plants, we also are uh, aimed at increasing the efficiency of those. Uh, second is our transmission division, which has just a about over $5 billion aimed at both the planning uh, and financing and facilitation of interregional transmission development uh, across the country. Uh, this has been a particular focus of the administration to try and help uh, both the planning as well as the facilitation uh, of new transmission lines as well as uh, uh, the repurposing of existing lines if, uh, if we can help on, on the modernization uh, side of that. So uh, that uh, I will note uh, the, the open uh, funding uh, request for proposals that are available through that division. There's uh, $2.5 uh, billion in the transmission facilitation program, which is specifically designed uh, at helping uh, the building of, of transmission lines that otherwise wouldn't be built without uh, the support for, for DOE. The proposals for that are due uh, February 1 uh, and, and fast approaching. Um, but we also have a number, a number of provisions available within the Inflation Reduction Act, um, including another $2 billion in loans and $760 million to help state and localities on the siting and permitting of, uh, of transmission lines. Uh, we also have uh, the DOE's transmission planning, both kind of the longer uh, uh, planning study as well as our need study, which is aimed at kind of the very specific, used to be con con called the congestion study for those that follow this closely. Uh, both of those studies are now within uh, GDO, so for anyone engaging with our with those studies, that's, that falls within our office. But uh, the last division, our grid modernization uh, division, which Kirsten uh, referenced uh, earlier on the big slide around the grid resilience funding, uh, all falls within uh, our office. Uh, 
Um, so folks will probably be aware of this, as that's uh, just uh, for that is about $13 billion uh, in grid resilience and, and innovation opportunities uh, as, as a part of that. Uh, $2.5 billion of that is the state formula grants, uh, which the applications are, are now open through March 31st when we're uh, happy to work with uh, uh, NASIO and, and all the uh, states on, on getting applications in. Uh, and then as, as folks uh, I know and working with uh, uh, GridWise has certainly been uh, following uh, our uh, announcement of uh, the opportunity around our GRIP program, uh, Grid Resilience and Innovation Partnership Program, which is $10.5 billion uh, in competitive financing available uh, across, uh, uh, across three separate programs. Uh, which uh, I think we included all the all the section numbers uh, across there, but what we how we are trying to uh, view those uh, is through really first is uh, two point five billion in competitive uh, for kind of grid hardening uh, and resilience overall, uh, three billion in the smart grid grants, which is uh, for those who are around in two thousand nine. Uh, with, with RF funding, that is the program that was uh, refunded as a part of this, notably because I have seen a number of press outlets and, and the trade press uh, calling this just uh, uh, another opportunity at AMI. There's a lot more uh, eligibility uh, in, in this program this time around, so would encourage folks to see the expanded te technology eligibility as, as a part of that. And then lastly is the Grid Innovation Program, which is, aimed, which is a $5 billion program uh, aimed at uh, innovative approaches to transmission and distribution overall. I recognize that is a lot of information all at once. Uh, taking a step back from all of that, uh, we've covered how much in funding uh, just on that. I think it's upwards of 50 billion that we just talked about in about four minutes. Uh, I recognize, we all recognize within DOE that this is a lot of information to take in before you even get to the application process um, in, in all of this. Uh, in my role and what we're doing within GDO, I, I, I can say that we are doing our best to try and make this as clear, accessible, and providing consistent information every day so you all can engage with this. We know that the implementation of this is impossible without, without working with all of you and trying to make, um, uh, make this work. My background, I spent a lot of time uh, at a trade association, so I'm, I'm familiar uh, with getting feedback uh, from, from industry, including some, from some familiar faces in this room. Uh, so if you have feedback on how we can be doing this better, please send it. Uh, you're happy to have my contact, informa uh, contact information sent, sent around. Uh, some of the ways that we've been trying to do this, uh, uh, trying to communicate all of this is attending conferences like this and working with groups and, and companies uh, such as the folks in this room uh, to communicate this out and answer questions as, as much as we can. Additionally, if you go on our uh, website uh, or even just Google GDO Conductor, uh, that is uh, our website that out outlines all of the grid and transmission financing opportunities that are available uh, at DOE, uh, not just within the Depart uh, grid deployment office, but across other offices as well. Uh, there is a new interactive tool uh, on that that allows for you to click through if you are interested, let's say you are a state and you're interested in undergrounding power lines, it will pitch you to the correct program that needs to go there. If you're a pri private company and you're interested in, in tr increasing transmission capacity, it will get you to the program that you need to do, and that is an attempt to try and uh, get that out there. I also recognize uh, that a lot of you are probably uh, uh, working on concept papers now uh, across uh, the GRIP program uh, on all of that. Uh, if you have questions, I am limited in, in what I can uh, answer on this since it is an, an active funding opportunity as a part of that. And uh, in the Q&A session, I will probably say that information is in the FOA. Um, but that said, uh, for all the questions that are coming in, uh, more often than not, that ends up in my email inbox. So thank you for sending to them. <laughs> Uh, this is in, these are new programs. As these questions are coming in, we are doing our best to update our website every single day to answer these questions. Uh, just please know on that, we do have to post all of our answers publicly, so they will reside on our website, so I am limited in terms of responding back to a specific email on specific things you may be answering. Um, but please go to the FAQ on our website where uh, those things are updated 
quite honestly, every day as we are getting questions in and trying to answer all of these. If you have a question, I am quite sure that someone else has that same question, so please do not uh, hesitate in, in asking that. And uh, uh, true, true to my form, as my family uh, always says, we'll keep this short, and then went on for about 10 minutes, so <laughs> I will stop there uh, and turn it over. 10 minutes for, you know, $20 billion. That's like, no. So uh, <laughs> next is um, Carl Imhoff who, with uh, Pacific Northwest National Laboratory. And I, for those of you on the panel, you may not be aware that Gridwise um, began in 2003. Uh, it, was, it was a, um, a collaboration between the Department of Energy, PNNL, and Gridwise. Some of the original um, people are here in the room. And Carl has been a steady presence and is an ex officio board member. Uh, and in fact, I think your office owns the Gridwise name and we rent it from you or some, some arrangement like that. So um, the National Labs, I wanted to have Carl here to give the perspective because the National Labs are both supporting DOE as they develop um, these programs and then also um, supporting outside stakeholders. So Carl. Awesome. Am I on? Yeah. Excellent. So I have to apologize. I'm the first speaker who doesn't have billions of dollars to offer to you. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to have to rely on my dance and singing skills. Uh, but what I, what I wanted to share a little bit is some of the uh, activities that are underway across the lab system uh, and DOE to help enhance the capacity of the states and regions to help respond to this really unique uh, opportunity. And I think the big challenge that we found in ARA time was how do you invest but invest in a way that's future proof so that things are, don't become stranded assets in three years that you're, they, they fit into the system that we're going to see in five and ten years. And, and even your uh, air traffic control system of 30 years from now. Uh, so uh, I'll share with you a little bit about what the, what the labs are doing, how that ties in with uh, DOE, and also what we're seeing in the Pacific Northwest. We've had a lot of in engagements there. Uh, so just briefly, uh, I, I, I chair the Grid Modernization Lab Consortium. It's 14 of the DOE laboratories who have worked with DOE for five years on grid modernization agendas. Predominantly R&D, predominantly five and 10 years out into the future, uh, but there is a, a broad base of uh, uh, intellectual capital that's been developed for technical assistance, distribution planning, uh, valuation for resilience, metrics for resilience, frameworks for competing and comparison, doing program evaluation on different resilience projects that we've delivered over the last five years in all regions of the country. And these are all assets that we're working to make available to the regions so that the regions can respond to these activities. And I have to say, my, my personal observation is all the big utilities know this drill. They did it in ARRA. They're well organized. They're hiring consultants to help them put together their strategies. But we have 3,500 utilities in this country. And most of those mid and small size have engineering staffs ranging from one person to five people. And so it's that middle, that, that layer of the utilities that are really struggling right now to understand where to play, how to play. Uh, they're working with state energy offices. Uh, but I think that's a, a really important piece of this whole uh, journey. And of course, my phone goes off, uh, just a second. Uh, and that, that we need to try to tackle. And that's where we see you know, some struggles going on. But uh, short story, the, the labs are working to help make this capacity available. Part of that is supporting the Grid Deployment Office, uh, working with NASIO in some recent uh, outreach meetings, identifying where the state energy office has seen the biggest gaps, and it's, it seems to be in the area of metrics and ability to compare and contrast competing project uh, proposals that are coming in, et cetera. And uh, there, that's leading to some website opportunities to help make available these existing sets of metrics and program evaluation and valuation for energy storage. Uh, that have been developed, some of which have been done for tribal communities. One of the projects of PNL is working with 14 indigenous nations around the country, helping them do valuation for energy storage for resilience hardening. And a lot of what we developed there can be directly applied to a lot of the GDO uh, activities coming forward. So uh, the, the labs are making that available through the GDO process. But you'd also think of the labs as being a regional resource for you. Uh, and so uh, communities, particularly smaller communities, are reaching out to the labs to, to request help in some of the data and modeling and other things to help them keep up with the big utilities, I guess, in terms of getting their, their applications together. Uh, and the Grid Modernization Lab Consortium, I don't have a slide, I can't give you a link, but if, if you reach out to that, you can find it on the web easily. Uh, we're happy to connect entities with uh, National Laboratory Resources of the Regions. And what do they have to offer? Uh, in addition to some of these analytic frameworks, uh, they have uh, test beds 
They have ability to test uh, hardware and new devices on a common basis. They maintain libraries of the, of the models of a lot of the new uh, digital devices so they can be reflected in, in regional planning models, et cetera. So they have a lot of assets that can help people put together better proposals for resilience and grid security and smart grid uh, activities going forward. Um, one other thing I, I would mention is one thing that seems to be missing is in, in the, everyone's hustle to understand the IIJA and, and frame approaches to respond, I'm seeing lots of individual entity responses and less of the collaborative multi-party responses. You see very few five and six utility entities trying to pursue a regional agenda. And you think of the Peach of Sound in, in Washington State, um, seismic events, Cascadia events, or major winter storms have had five or six utilities. And so what, what I'm not seeing yet is the capacity to help get multiple utilities together to respond to those activities. And I hope that in years two, three, four, and five, we get more of those activities. And that's an area I, I think it would be useful to explore. If you have interest of that in your local areas, please reach out to uh, the folks here at GDO or to the R&D side of DOE, which would be the Office of Electricity or ERE, and they would be happy to try to find ways to provide that capacity at the regional level to build up some of those multi-party uh, applications. If not this year, it's probably getting a little late for this year, but in, in subsequent years, I think that would be very important uh, going forward. Uh, and I think that's pretty much it. Uh, well, the one last thing I would mention is on the, on the R&D side, to Larry Gray Burrell's and Larry Beckett points earlier, um, as we move to this high inverter-based resource system, you know, we need new ways to control the system. We need new ways to protect the system. And we need new ways to protect the secure design of all the digital devices we're putting on here that operate much faster than our control devices today. Uh, so there is opportunity for uh, R&D to add value over the next 5, 10, and, and 20 years. And the uh, DOE Grid Modernization Initiative is planning a, um, uh, uh, an R&D FOA coming out probably the second quarter of this fiscal year. In the past, we've worked with over 200 entities, many of which are sitting in this room right now, uh, and they expect to put out a, a RFI probably in January or February to give the utilities plenty of time to begin organizing, self-organizing, identifying where they might fit into some R&D agenda. So it's not just deployment, it's not just R&D, it's really, I think, the, the integration of near-term deployment and, and demonstration, but with an eye to this, what's the system gonna look like, how do we future-proof today's investments, so that they can actually deliver to the system we're gonna have five and 10 and 20 years from now. So those are my comments. Right. Thanks, Carl. So I'm gonna pause here and um, see if uh, there are questions from the audience about clarifications or, and just noting that um, DOE is not gonna be able to tell you what a winning application is gonna be. It's, you know, so this is really your, your opportunity to ask some questions, but understand that what I'm hoping for later on is really a discussion back and forth about the things that we can all do together to move this money more smoothly to actually have quite effective results. So are there questions for the people with the federal perspective? See David? He's... Hi, uh, David Hunter, EPRI. Um, it just too good an opportunity to pass up having a, a GDO person sitting next to an OCED person. Um, and I just wonder if you can say a little bit more about how your two offices are working together. And particularly, you know, there were some, uh, well, you know, obviously when Congress passed the, the BIL, um, it didn't mention GDO, it did mention OCED and, and did send certain pots of money um, specifically to OCED, which are now, I think, as I understand it, being, you know, broadly coordinated by GDO. Um, but to, so just a little bit more about sort of, you know, on some of the things that where Congress said that goes to OCED and, and GDO is playing the overall role, how your offices are working together on And then there's Office of Electricity. Then there's the Office of Electricity. Yes. Yeah, uh, well, I mean, like, we are coordinated across all of the offices that are in there, not just uh, OSED uh, and GDO, but with the Loan Programs Office, uh, with uh, Manufacturing uh, and Supply Chain Office. I mean, there, there's a lot of uh, coordination, particularly at our leadership level, to make sure that when these investments are, are going forth, uh, that we're aware of them, so you're not trying to you know, have uh, interlap, uh, overlapping uh, investments that are being made. Uh, I would say even within offices, that is some of the intention of what we're trying to do and coordinating across that. Uh, that was the intention behind GRIP, for example, of trying to recognize that all of these are really touching on grid resilience, 
wanted to release them all, all at once so people are thinking them in coordination um, as a part of that. Uh, as it relates to uh, uh, kind of the creation of the office, uh, that was a part of the realignment uh, decision uh, made overall to try and help with uh, deployment. I think as, as Courtney said, uh, OSED is uh, focused on, on kind of that, that uh, in-between investment, whereas uh, the grid deployment office is really uh, focused on kind of commercialized technologies and trying to help uh, uh, get that um, uh, that we know technologies are already there. It's just trying to fund infrastructure projects overall. So that's kind of the interplay. But it is, we work closely with one another because the the technology and the investments are, are um, uh, quite similar, so. Yeah, and I would just also add to it too, you know, stakeholder engagement is a kind of a huge priority across DOE. So we also get together across offices, those in those roles to really understand who we're talking to, what we're hearing and trying to share resources. We're helpful too, so that we're not all reaching out to the same people all the time and continuing to overwhelm the market. So I think we're just trying to work smarter, honestly, at every corner as far as timelines and sequencings and mapping and understanding those opportunities, but then really focus on the people too and just make sure that we're, we're continuously sharing. So there's formal interagency working groups that have been set up more at the leadership level, but then there's a, a lot of staff, I would say, informal interagency working groups where we're trying to talk all the time. Training us today, thank you. Um, Mona Shethwa Schneider Electric uh, handling IIJ issues. Uh, is there any thought that has been given to what resources will be available after the first round of funding closes. Uh, so I've already mentally moved to 2023, I think, in my mind. Uh, I think that everyone is hoping for maybe not templates, but just guidance and general things like that. Has there been a thought been given to that and how that might be presented and whether it be publicly available? Um, I would kind of two answers to that. One is we are thinking about the capacity building resources and technical assistance that will be rolled out over time, um, realizing that not every community or every aggregator is going to be ready for that first funding opportunity. And we also don't want anyone to waste time by applying now. So we are thinking about those type of programming, both from a planning perspective and permitting and site selection point of view to actually then um, thinking about resources for that local stakeholder engagement and building out those partnerships and also thinking about long-term financing models. Um, so we are thinking about those type of resources over time. Also exploring partnership intermediary uh, agreements to think about that aggregator approach. Um, and then I would say kind of second to that is once we do have grantees, it is thinking about almost like a community of practice and sharing best practices over time so that these case studies and these results can, can kind of continue to be harnessed and leveraged. Uh, short answer is yes. Uh, we are very frequently already talking about the summer when uh, after awards have been made, how what, what are we already learning through the process that can make this a little bit easier and make sure that we're um, uh, making this as broadly accessible uh, to as many entities as possible. Uh, I will note particularly for the GRIP funding, uh, since we are a year behind on fiscal years uh, for this funding, we did bundle fiscal years 22 and 23 together for the initial uh, round is that. So that's 3.8 billion in the first tranche of what that is, but that is a $10.5 billion program overall. Uh, so that's what, what is available and we will move forward um, uh, at the close of that into future years of that. Um, because we've gotten questions around that, that is bundled money uh, all in one pot right now. Should we not use all of it, it will roll over into future years. Uh, as a part of that. Um, but again, as I said uh, at the top here, uh, this is why all of the questions that are coming in are so helpful. Uh, so if we, you know, given the timeline on some of these things, we may not be able to make adjustments uh, or, or uh, certain things as, as we're going through on the implementation side of this. But uh, trust me, when there's already uh, a, a shareable uh, Word doc right now uh, taking place on all of the lessons learned of where we can, may be able to make adjustments in the future on this, that's certainly happening. Yep. Hey, uh, 
Steve Hauser with AEIC. Hi, Dylan. I've got a question for you, Dylan. Yes. Sorry. And this may be too specific. If so, you can tell me to, to go ask somebody else. But <laughs> go to the I, website. <laughs> I, I noticed in the GRIP program that one, at least one of the elements has a set aside for small utilities, mm -hmm. right? And small utilities are defined in that FOA. But in reading it last night, there was an asterisk that said the intent was to award three $100 million projects to small utilities. And as Carl mentioned, there's over 3,000 utilities in the country. And if that's true, only three out of 3,000 get an award. Is that, am I misunderstanding that or do you know what that means? There, so yes, there is a set aside and we are aware of um, all the outreach. Um, uh, that needs to be done to make sure that this is accessible, uh, not to just folks that, uh, quite frankly, can come to conferences like this. We, we need to be doing a lot of uh, outreach um, to make sure that everyone has that access to that. In terms of specific funding levels that are a part of that and how much will be a part of that, um, I'll defer all specifics to that uh, on, on the final FOA. I do know within the draft that we had put out some guidelines of what we were thinking about, but. I'll have to defer back to the, the final FOA on that one to not uh, give incorrect information. Other questions? Hi, everyone. And Sean Crimmins with EPRI. Um, several folks have mentioned interoperability several times over the last day and a half and uh, common information model came up and there's, there's lots of other standards out there as well. Interoperability, this, um, there seems to be a mixed message whether interoperability is part of this, the GRIP, smart grid proposals, GFO. I'm just wondering if you could expand a little bit more. One section says interoperability and data architectures are important and then there is a Another section of things that are not allowed, and that mentions interoperability as well. So could you expand a little bit more on that? Again, I'll have to, uh, I'm sorry, but we'll have to defer back to the uh, final foe on that. If there are uh, questions that you want to submit specific to that, uh, yeah. I would uh, recommend that. But in general, the priority investments do include uh, uh, interoperability and uh, data architecture as eligible priority investments within smart grid grants. And is, again, if, if possible, can you tell me if that's something that could be the primary objective of the project, or is that just something that comes along with the deployment of some technology? There's a lot of different priority investment areas as a part of that grant, uh, or mm -hmm. as, a, as a part of that grant, as well as the other uh, funding opportunities that we have as, as a part of it. Until we get concept papers and everything, it's, it, we can't, it, it, this is true of a lot of things of, yeah. We've heard, con we've heard ideas, but we don't know what the concept papers are going to look like, so it's hard to, we, we can't commit to anything until we really know what's coming in on that, but encourage folks to submit guess, ideas as a part of I guess there's one that. way to find out then. Right, <laughs> yes, yes. Well, on December 16th. December 16th. Uh, yeah, on December 16th, we'll see what comes in. And our deadline's 5 p.m. Eastern, not, what was the? Yeah, 11, mi the yeah middle, middle of grid connects. 11.45, yeah. we'll cut it, so yeah. That's also yeah. good to know. So how about yeah. one more question for the, for the federal folks from Anne? Oh, by the way, um, halfway through, this is being recorded. <laughs> Surprise. Yeah, no, you knew. <laughs> but I just realized I wrote myself. After the federal presentation. Uh, yeah, you're right. <laughs> That's good. Don't send it to general counsel's yeah. office. Right. So my question related to a previous question, and for grid, uh, especially the topic area number one, so uh, 10 awards, right, each one 100 million. And then we're talking about uh, cost matching is 100%. So that's 100 million. And then speaking of 30% allocated for small utility, how can utility you know, come up with that much uh, uh, the cost matching? I talked to a lot of utility. That's the biggest issue. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a different cost match for small utilities. So I would right. note that um, on... on, on well, uh, to some extent, uh, a lot of what we are doing is implementing what was written in the law. Uh, and so we are restricted a little bit. We do hear familiar things, recognizing that the cost share is very difficult, particularly for small 
um, entities as a part of that, but we are restricted in terms of what was written into the law on requirements within cost share. So we, we hear you and we are doing our best to try and make this as accessible as possible. We are a little restricted in terms of the cost share um, on that overall. Um, I will have to make sure that our website provides clarity um, around uh, funding sizes uh, as, as, as a part of this because I think there may be some confusion around that. So let me see if we can get some uh, uh, details ar around that. So, And Courtney, you want to know, in, in, I mean, I just say in your, um, in your request for information for the energy improvements for rural remote areas, you don't have a cost share in mind yet. You were asking whether the 50% was appropriate. Yeah, our, our program, um, we're just in the design phase, so we don't have an active funding opportunity announcement yet, and we are thinking about the cost share, certainly asking a lot of questions, because we might, for this provision, have the ability to, to waive it if we get the, enough evidence. And, and we did, in our comments, we said that it was 50% was very high for small utilities. So, well, thank you very much. Let's turn to the um, getting the state perspective, and I'm going to start with the governors. So Dan Lauf is with um, is the uh, program director for energy for the National Governors Association. <laughs> why, are you, why are you laughing? Oh, it's not for me. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Which one? But, awesome. So, um, it's good to see everybody here. Um, you know, I'm Dan Loff with the National Governors Association. Um, we're the member association for the nation's 55 state and territorial governors. Um, I'm the energy program director over at NGA, so I work closely with governors energy policy advisors. But um, in my remarks, I wanted to actually go a bit broader than energy because as governors are looking at these programs, um, IAJA is huge. And especially when you look at IAJA alongside IRA alongside CHIPS and all of the other opportunities coming to the states and to the private sector and local governments um, for investment. Um, so when we work with governors at NGA, um, we do convene the energy policy advisors and work closely with them, but we're also working closely with broadband advisors, um, transportation advisors, uh, workforce, cybersecurity, homeland security, um, tribal liaisons, uh, education advisors, et cetera. Um, my point there being, you know, governors have a very broad view when they think about what's best for their states and when they try to engage with partners within their states to um, deploy investments optimally, including those coming from the federal government for infrastructure funding. Um, so over the last year, we've seen, uh, I think, nearly 50 governors appoint uh, new governance structures, essentially um, cross-cutting infrastructure coordinators whose role it is to um, try to make sense of all of the funding coming from the, from the federal government, uh, from originally IAJA, although now many of them are also working on IRA and other programs, to try to uh, understand where there's a need for investment, um, work with their um, agency partners, including state energy officials, transportation officials, and others to uh, craft meaningful applications and really try to make the best use of federal funding um, as it comes through. So uh, we've been convening those infrastructure coordinators on at least a quarterly basis. We actually have, it, have them coming into D.C. in just a couple of days for some meetings over at USDOT. Um, and they're really eager to hear from folks like you about where there is the need, how they should be navigating these programs, and what they should be prioritizing. So just a, a little bit more, first of all, about these uh, these roles, because they are, I think, important roles for you all to understand and get to know within your states. Um, again, there are, there are near, just about every state and territory has somebody in this role. That said, where they sit is going to vary state by state. Um, in some cases, they're existing policy advisors um, in the governor's office. Um, or chiefs or deputy, deputy chiefs of staff. In other cases, there may be a former elected official, a local official or legislator who's been brought in to fill that role. Um, in some states, it's a cabinet secretary who's been dual-hatted as the infrastructure coordinator. And then in others, it's actually the governor's uh, Washington, D.C. representative um, sitting here in D.C. working directly with the federal government to coordinate across those programs. Um, and their role is really to, again, collaborate and coordinate 
um, across agencies, across levels of government, and with the private sector to identify um, where the governor is going to, uh, you know, throw their weight around for investments or th for applications and how the governor can support um, applications within their states. Um, there have been a number of ways that these entities are working to engage with um, stakeholders and other levels of government across their states. I know a number of governors have held um, infrastructure conferences or energy conferences and are continuing to do so. Um, many have set up infrastructure sub-cabinets. I know um, uh, Maryland is, is one such state, I think Nevada as well. Um, so fitting that we're all on a panel together. And, um, and others are, are really uh, creating public-facing hubs and, and really trying to find the best ways to um, engage publicly because there is a lot of funding coming down the line. There's a lot of opportunity here. But with all of that opportunity, uh, it comes, frankly, a lot of challenge to navigate across those programs. Um, in just a, a short amount of time, you heard about tens of billions of dollars coming from part of the Department of Energy. Uh, notwithstanding the, the rest of the Department of Energy and Department of Commerce and Transportation and EPA and DOI, et cetera. So um, really where I think there's a lot of opportunity for you all to work with governors and um, for to frankly support states in these investments and to help the states support you all is through meaningful and regular collaboration outreach. Um, I know the states are, are generally trying to do that, um, but making that a two-way street and just as you have priorities, as you have, as you have ideas, you know, coming to your governors early and, and often with those priorities, especially when we're looking outside of formula funding and at some of these competitive funding opportunities that maybe aren't going through the states or maybe are going through the states and or multiple other partners work with um, your state partners, either at the gubernatorial level or at the agency level, to let them know what you're thinking about, what your priority is, so that we can try to identify um, you know, that alignment. I think importantly also, and a challenge that I know we're all facing with um, these programs is that, again, there is so much funding available, but across so many different interconnected infrastructure systems. And so, you know, we're all energy people here. I'm an energy person. Um, I love all things energy. However, uh, you know, none of us invest in energy just for the sake of energy, but energy is used for, to support other systems, and these systems are all interdependent. So trying to understand, you know, if you're looking to, um, if your priority is to invest in, say, in every, or to see meaningful funding come through for electric vehicles, Electric vehicle infrastructure is dependent on um, smart transmission and distribution infrastructure. Where are there gaps that we can let, where we can leverage other programs to fill those gaps um, to support transportation electrification? Then, of course, if you're looking at um, smart transmission distribution infrastructure, you need broadband to be able to do that. Um, to deploy any of this, you need to have the workforce in place. You need to address supply chain issues. So again, it gets complicated real fast, which also underscores just this need for um, continued collaboration um, to identify those challenges and then work together to find um, solutions to those challenges. Those solutions are certainly not all going to originate at the governor's offices or even at the state level, and that's where working with partners like you all can help them, you know, can I, I think help us collectively to find ways to navigate those and to identify uh, good paths forward. Uh, similarly, there's a lot of funding coming from the federal government, but, but as I think you've heard already, um, I hate to say it's not enough because it is a whole lot of funding, but when we talk about matching funds and leveraging private investment as well, um, there is a need to think about how do we take these dollars and, and stretch them further to really reach across our states, to reach across communities, including and especially those that are underserved, and that's where um, thinking creatively with you all about what good financing opportunities are, funding opportunities, or public-private partnerships um, to leverage those funds, that I think can be very meaningful. Um, and then the, the last um, area where I wanted to offer an opportunity for meaningful collaboration, although I think there is quite a bit of opportunity, is around the planning processes that you've heard about. So, I think just in, in 
the last hour alone, we've heard about um, energy security planning, grid resilience planning, uh, NEVI, which is planning around electric vehicle infrastructure deployment, um, community benefits planning, and that's in addition to other transmission and distribution system planning, um, digital equity planning, and other, um, you know, for lack of a better word, plans that are um, that states are being asked to complete to really meaningfully deploy this work, and that's something that. Um, you know, they really, generally speaking, uh, you know, governors in the states aren't looking to do that in a bubble, but they're really going to look to all of you, to their private sector partners, to their local government partners, to inform those plans and help to understand where, again, investments are needed, where there are gaps, and how they can be, um, how this money can be put to good use. So. Um, I'll pause there because I really am looking forward to the Q&A session, but just wanted to offer that, you know, again, these are, this, these, this is really um, truly an unprecedented opportunity, but it is complex. It's wide reaching within the energy sector and beyond. And so there really is um, a lot of opportunity, again, for us to collaborate across sectors, across the public and private sectors and um, you know, I'd encourage you all again to work with your governors, work with the officials in your states to help them understand where your priorities are, um, help them understand how you can support their priorities and coordinate investments to the extent possible. So um, I'll pause there and um, leave some time for my. Yeah. Thanks, Dan. So I think uh, a lot of our members are very interested in how regulators are thinking about this huge infusion of money. And, you know, you cannot speak for every regulator across the country or even within your own state, but we would love to hear your perspective. So this is um, Jason Stanek, who's the chair of the Maryland Public Service Commission. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Uh, it's good to see some old faces and meet oh. some new ones. So GridWise has long been known for the grid modernization index that some of you are familiar with. They, they ranked every, every state in terms of a number of, of factors and metrics. And I'm, I'm proud to report that Maryland has consistently ranked within the, the top three uh, at the most recent survey back in, in 2018. So, so why does a public utility commissioner up in Baltimore care so much about the grid? Hence, because the grid is, is broken. Uh, we have problems at the distribution level. We have problems at the wholesale level. Some of you may have seen the Sunday before last, we had a small plane that crashed into a 230 KV transmission tower just up the road by about 15 miles, took out 100,000 customers, closed schools for the next day. Um, it, was, it was quite a disaster. Six o'clock on a Sunday evening, low visibility, rain. Look at what happened two nights ago in Moore County, North Carolina. Some sick individual shot up a substation, two substations there. Again, put about 100,000 customers out of power on a cold night. 30,000 today are still out of, of service. So the, the BIL or the IIJA, as we're referring to it, does provide an opportunity. And you've heard my articulate colleagues explain the opportunities and challenges associated with uh, this money. And I've been directed by Annapolis to ensure that in terms of our utilities, our 19 electric and gas utilities in the state of Maryland, don't leave any money on the table. So we're working with our colleagues at the Department of, of Energy. When Dylan said they, they do stakeholder outreach, it's almost too intense. I get three emails a day asking for <laughs> input on how to build a better grid or um, with respect to so many of these programs. But as one of 53 state utility commissions, I can tell you, some states have very small staff, maybe a dozen or two dozen. Some states like Virginia, California, Pennsylvania have hundreds of staff at the PSC. I have about 156. That relies on us to work with our utilities, to work with vendors, members of the Gridwise Alliance who support and provide services, to bring all of these opportunities to my utility's attention, to the Public Service Commission's attention so we can act on it. Because number one, we know that the grid is aging and it's aging quickly. Parts of my grid are upwards of 80 years old distribution system. We recognize that electrification is only going to increase with, with speed in the coming months and years. Just last week, Montgomery County, Maryland became the first county 
in the United States to require an all-electric building code. The benefits of that will be debated, whether it be economic effects, environmental effects. And then finally, we, we see a push amongst many states, and I would consider Maryland among the more progressive in terms of the renewable portfolio standards. 50% by 2030, 40% uh, and net zero by, by 2040. And in order to get there, we need to take advantage of the, these opportunities. A few billion here, a few billion there, and it begins to, to add up. So we've been working with our um, various departments. As Dan just said, uh, Governor Hogan in Maryland created a, a czar for the infrastructure funds, and there's a number of uh, agency heads who are, are tapped to be in that sub-cabinet to ensure that no money is left on the table. Uh, we've uh, worked with our transportation department to make sure that our NEVI funding is there because <coughs> we surely want our share of the $7.5 billion of electric vehicle charging. And I have to say Maryland is the number one state per capita in the mid-Atlantic in terms of electric vehicle charging. But we're also a resource-constrained state. We import about a third of our electricity from neighbors in PGM and in Virgin from Virginia. And our grid is weak, and we need to take advantage of, of all these funding opportunities. So we will have our applications filed on time with, with the DOE. Um, we are assisting our fellow PSCs who are not as familiar with navigating the politics of Washington and making sure those applications are filed on time. Um, and I look forward to hearing from the, the final two presenters on this panel today. Thank you, Karen. Thank you. Uh, and then our next panelist is Dave Peters, who's the Associate Program Manager for Resilience and Sustainability at AASHTO, which is the state highway, uh, the organization that represents state highway offices, transportation offices. That's right, yeah. So uh, I'm excited to talk about a program that I'm really charged up about. Um, and yeah, how to, come on, it's the end of the day. Uh, <laughs> So I'm going to talk a little bit about the NEVI program, and then we can get plugged into the uh, uh, Ashto Nazio program. Um, I'm exhausted. Yeah. <laughs> um, so the NEVI program, for those who aren't aware, is a $5 billion program over five years. Um, it's going to be put out through USDOT and through the State Departments of Transportation. This funding is through a formula program. And it is good until expended. So even though it's a five-year program, um, you can use the funds for as long as you need to until they're gone, which is great because uh, of supply chain issues right now. But um, there's a couple caveats to this uh, program. Um, there is a 10% carve-out for uh, special um, or pro projects of significance trying to gap fill that USDOT will do grant programs for. And then also um, the states, I guess, well, the way that they're approaching it right now is um, the all fuel corridors, if you're familiar with this program, was a way that states designated routes and corridors that um, they wanted to, uh, I guess, support um, different types of transportation modes uh, and energy sources. So a lot of states are approaching their NEVI program by building out um, charging along those all fuel corridors, and we anticipate that's how the first couple years of this program will go. There's a lot more flexibility once a state is deemed built out under this program, and that comes from USDOT. Um, and once they have that, they can shift and focus more on their state priorities, local community, uh, just generally more flexible. Um, so all 50 states, uh, and along with D.C. and Puerto Rico, submitted their NEVI plans that were required as part of this program, and they were all approved, and, uh, which was exciting. There were a couple exemptions, and those will be things states can submit every year of the program. Um, but for now, the states are trying to head toward deployment. Um, and so this is where, and Kirsten mentioned it a little earlier, but ASHTO and NASIO um, are working on a joint project, which its full title, I had to write it down, is Building a National EV Infrastructure Network. I'm pretty on the nose. But um, it's a project where we're trying to bring together uh, state DOT and state energy office officials uh, to make sure that that collaboration that Dan was just talking about is really happening um, at a consistent and, um, I guess, down to regional and even, um, you know, sub-regional level um, as we talk about state and local as well. Uh, so part of this project is um, regional convenings. Um, so we have monthly calls with all, uh, we split the country into six regions. I know a lot of organizations split them in their own ways. We landed on six somehow. So 
uh, we have six monthly calls um, with each region where we really discuss, you know, the issues and challenges and barriers that they're facing. And so, for example, the past few we've focused on procurement methods and how states will approach contracting. Now, this is going to vary in a lot of states, so we've done some work to try and figure out what some of these, um, I guess, main models will be, whether it's P3 like Dan mentioned or, you know, more of a grant program some states are going to approach um, the funds by dispensing it through a competitive process. Uh, and then a few states will use a, uh, a standard kind of uh, design, build, maintain, operate method. Um, so, you know, those are some of the things we talked about. We're also trying to engage our utility partners, both the, the commission's uh, services and also the utility providers. Um, so we just recently finished a, uh, the first of what will hopefully be quarterly conversations that we bring in either utility commissioners or um, utility providers to come in and uh, just discuss, you know, how the states need to, state DOTs need to start working with utilities or utility providers. Um, and these calls were incredibly helpful um, for getting a timeline um, that maybe some states hadn't considered in terms of, you know, we talked a little bit about supply chain issues on the DOT side um, with, you know, the EV charges themselves. But hearing from the utility providers, the delays in, you know, switch gear and some of the conduit and even transformers, things like that, really, uh, I think, was an important piece of information that DOTs are going to consider as they start to deploy these pieces. You know, what do the timelines actually look like? You know, they have this money, but how do you start deploying it if there's substantial constraints on the resources that you have available right now? Um, so we have two other aspects of the project as well. These are resources and tools that we're developing. Um, there's a states-only clearinghouse that we have where states have been sharing sample RFPs, RFIs, a really just a resource hub for them to try and, uh, as we talked about the collaboration, really make sure that you know, they are hearing from their peers in both energy offices and DOTs across the country um, and how they're approaching some of the similar issues. We're also working on uh, starting to work on a model, a statement of work uh, for some of these uh, charging projects. And, you know, we would welcome input on, you know, what are some considerations as you build out charging sites? What, what is pertinent information that you need, whether it's for utilities as they do site analysis or DOTs to include in these kind of scopes of work, statements of work? Um, we're, so we're just starting on that. And then I did mention our calls with the utilities and uh, utility folks, but we're also trying to engage the private sector. You know, Dan mentioned $5 billion uh, and, and all these uh, different projects. It sounds like a lot of money, and it is, but when you start to really slice it year by year over all the states, it isn't as much as it sounds like. And so leveraging partnerships and other funding pots is really crucial uh, to make sure this deployment happens. And so we will be holding a national convening um, later in the summer, and we hope to incorporate some of our other utility partners and private sector generally because we know that you know this EV deployment one it's not going to be done just through Nevi with five billion dollars there's a lot more that's needed but you know with the private sector and other partners uh, you know there's there's a better chance of really building on that groundwork that Nevi will lay um, so I think I will stop there I have no more bad puns so <laughs> I think that's my Thanks, cue. Steve. And then, and then to the second David in a row, David Bobzien, who's the, uh, for now, the director of the Nevada Governor's Energy Office. Whether, whether he has 25 days or one day left will depend on what he says but who's as it's being recorded. Yeah. <laughs> um, thank you, Karen, and, and thank you uh, for uh, making sure that I had comrades in arms when I accepted this assignment to have the deadly... Uh, wrap-up panel post-lunch. It feels so much better to be up here with a whole big panel. It sort of ensures that you have... It will have eight people lunch. left in the room. It, 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 it ensures <laughs> that there's some people still in the room if you have this many people at the table. But, um, you know, special credit to everyone else that's still here and sticking it out. I guess that means that we're mildly interesting in what we're, what we're communicating here. So this is, this is really good. Um, I want to shamelessly... Uh, put in a plug for, for NASIO and NGA and all the support that they do. And I think it's really important for uh, partners that are here in the room to recognize just the massive value they bring to this conversation. Um, a smaller state like Nevada, um, you know, Maryland may, may be able to share um, some similar perspectives. Um, the work that they do is invaluable. We wouldn't be able to do a lot of what we're doing. We just wouldn't be able to keep up with just the, the fire hose of, of information um, that's coming down um, from the federal government around um, IIJA. Uh, and I may kind of surface some specific examples in my, in my remarks here. 
Um, also uh, wanted to, from the, to set the table, just kind of echo some of the things that, that Dan said to give the Nevada perspective. Um, I will try to not repeat some of the things that I've mentioned yesterday, um, other than the fact that yes, a lot of this information probably has a shelf life of about 26 days. Um, but uh, as Dan mentioned, uh, the greater context, Nevada does have a point person in the governor's office for um, all infrastructure. Um, that person and I happen to be uh, going to the Hill tomorrow to brief one of our senators on everything that's happening. And um, I want to uh, put a pin in um, the expectations challenge uh, that comes with that. Uh, we also have recently had uh, an infrastructure summit, which I think was really valuable uh, for getting the word out uh, in state uh, about the opportunities and really a, a, a call uh, that I'll echo again here for everyone's uh, creativity, problem solving, partnership in making sure that the money is deployed and deployed uh, effectively. So uh, the Governor's Office of Energy in Nevada, we have uh, 10 employees. We are a smaller state uh, energy office. Uh, for instance, I have one program manager that's handling all of the grid uh, opportunities. Uh, she is backed up by uh, one uh, management analyst. Uh, and so it's, it's all hands on deck when you think of all of the different energy opportunities. Uh, and so the staffing has been um, quite, uh, uh, quite a challenge. Um, we have our uh, SCP uh, application in. Uh, we're excited about that uh, because we, we really need some of that, uh, that money uh, to build up our resources so that we have a better platform for uh, being competitive for uh, a lot of the grants that are coming. And also want to put a shout out to DOE. All of our interactions with all the various offices uh, have been just really very invaluable. And yes, we understand that oftentimes it's, well, go read the FOA or you know, go ask the question. And, and, and we understand that. We, um, but I think even in that um, construct, there's been amazing flexibility, uh, oversharing of information, but um, it's been really helpful. And so that's been a very positive experience. Uh, we uh, are the beneficiary, uh, thanks to our friends at DOE, who understood that our state energy security plan needed a little bit of work. Um, they were able to give us a, uh, uh, a grant. We're out to RFP on uh, finding a vendor to help us with our state energy security plan. Here again, shout out to NASIO for all of the hand-holding and help and assistance that they've provided, provided Nevada to get us to where we are on that. So we're excited to um, be moving forward with that. So that's one uh, area and opportunity for, for partnership. I uh, want to mention on NEVI, uh, that is uh, a huge relief for our office because we were sort of the, the incubator uh, experimentalists when it came to our use of the Volkswagen settlement uh, to launch the Nevada Electric Highway. We are very glad to pass the project responsibilities over to our DOT uh, and advise with our expert perspectives <laughs> on, on policy and implications and, and, and deployment, but it's, it's great to see. I think the joint office uh, at the federal level that's come together and just, I mean, that, it's monumental how much stuff that they're doing there. And so we're, we're excited that that's, that that's moving forward. Um, I do want to mention hydrogen hubs, um, maybe against my better judgment. Um, we are engaged on that. We do, um, uh, we have signed on as a partner on one of the concept paper one, one of the concept papers. I just want to flag that as one more grid-related uh, stream that is out there. Um, we're certainly looking at it from the perspective of storage opportunities uh, and, and, and benefits to the grid. So 40101D, um, this is just a, a great story of, of, of the collaboration with DOE, but also just how quickly things are moving and how the information goes um, uh, at, at, at light speed. Uh, we felt a little uh, bummed at first when we heard that DOE was pushing back the deadline to um, March 31st of this next year because we sort of felt like we were already ahead of the game by having our application done, having held our public hearing. We were ready to go. We were like, wait a minute, why, why are you guys moving the, the goalposts? And what was funny was we had um, in, in Tempe uh, a couple months back our Western Interstate Energy Board conference. We had a, a panel, uh, it was myself, Idaho, Oregon, and I believe Colorado, and we had Maria Robinson in the in the in the audience, and the four of us up on stage were under the impression that there was no benefit to applying prior to the March 31st deadline because we were all under the impression, mistakenly, that the bank wasn't open yet. And so Maria corrected us from the the audience, and we all of a sudden had this like 
complete retooling of our strategy live in uh, in front of our audience about okay, well, we need to get our application in. So we're we're, we're <laughs> it's like well, I'm not gonna wait around for the money. Um, so we're gonna we're we're putting in our 401 D uh, application um, in in uh, before the end of this year. That is on my list, uh, recognizing um, the shelf life considerations. Um, also want to mention quick detour on the tribal outreach, and I think it was appropriate. What I understand was that a lot of the challenges for 401 d um, we saw that firsthand in Nevada, and I think that that's another area where we need partnership and support. Um, we take very seriously that imperative that uh, we need to get the money, right? I think we've heard that theme. Uh, that we want to make sure that the money comes to the states, comes to our communities, and is spent. And so uh, we, our office, our small office trying to do outreach, um, did some partnership with our tribal council, uh, our, our, excuse me, our Indian Commission to the tribal council to make sure that our uh, tribal nations in Nevada um, were aware of the opportunities. I mean, we have incredibly disparate um, uh, experiences with tribes uh, when it comes to uh, energy, uh, the Moapa Band of Paiutes in southern Nevada, just, you know, amazingly sophisticated in their approach to, to solar uh, development and energy, and then we have other uh, communities, you know, much more resource constrained, and so um, it's a big lift to try to just get that information out in front of folks and, and, and let them know that, you know, this is, this is their opportunity and they get to lead on us, and so we, we get to support. Um, GRIP has been mentioned. Uh, I just want to point uh, to uh, what's happening in the West. We have a really interesting um, industry facilitated communication network happening uh, with Western states. We're all putting in concept papers. We're, we're kicking around some ideas around wildfire and resilience. Uh, so we're trying to get that in and we're, 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 we're racing to, to get that um, moving forward and make sure that we have a uh, at least a ticket to the dance to be able to do the full applications once the concepts are in. So I think just to close it out, the, the, the challenges that I'll, I'll, I'll point to, um, some of these have been uh, mentioned before, but I'll, I'll give them each a, a, a unique spin. So the cost share, we understand, um, and I think it was appropriate. This is another, another one of those managing expectations challenges. Is, you know, the law is the law, guys. Like, you know, oh my gosh, the 30% cost share. It's like, okay, what are you going to do? Not spend the money? Um, so we've We've actually uh, uh, appreciated some of the evolution of guidance that we've gotten from DOE on cost share. Uh, our energy office is in a, in a really unique spot in that we don't have any general fund money. We have a, uh, a set pool of funds uh, that will be depleted at some point in the future. Um, but that does actually give us a little bit of flexibility um, to hopefully be able to meet some of that cost share um, uh, obligation that we see coming down the road. But at the same time, yeah, at some point we're going to have to go to the legislature and, and ask for some more funds uh, to hit the cost share requirements that fall on us that we are not otherwise able to pass along to um, participants. For instance, in 401 d it was you know, it, it is what it is, uh, 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 utility and co-ops, uh, that you may have to take a portion of our cost share responsibilities because we, we can't otherwise cover it. The uh, stakeholder outreach piece and organizing that, I think we've heard at the federal level that, you know, there's so much coming and it's hard to kind of keep up with it. We see that at the state level, and I think that's going to be a big challenge for um, state infrastructure points is trying to organize that outreach. We have done our best in the energy office to make sure that, okay, if we're touching 10 different community organizations, can we just do one touch at a time and not like, oh, and then there's this program, and then there's this program, and then there's this program. It's like, you know, they people get meetinged out pretty quickly uh, on the ground. And so I think states coming up with a really organized uh, way to make sure that that um, stakeholder engagement happens in a meaningful way is, is a really big challenge that we're, we're going to continue to need some coaching on. Um, and then similar to that, and I mentioned this yesterday, Justice 40. We have fantastic guidance. We have all these tools coming from the federal government. Um, but I keep harping on the fact that Justice 40 and its evaluation as to whether or not you did it or not is going to vary state by state by state. And in Nevada, it's going to be up to 63 legislators to examine how each agency uh, accomplished that Justice 40 imperative uh, when they get to the budget process. And I think that's one of those ones in Nevada in particular 
um, buckle up uh, for next session in terms of how that conversation goes down. Um, but yeah, the, the, the organizing, um, the, the metrics of how do you meaningfully do Justice 40, we heard yesterday that in Nevada with uh, EV infrastructure spending, uh, there's a very sort of strict, um, uh, you know, um, um, income-based census uh, tract uh, logic to it, and we know that it's, it's, it's actually much more amorphous than that and, and is probably a little more flexible. We need validators. We need people to come in and say, hey, from the outside, this office did a really good job and they had meaningful impact, whether that's anecdotally or whatever. Uh, again, when state energy offices are in front of their legislatures to say that, yes, this program was successful and it had meaningful impact uh, for those communities that have been uh, left out in the past. So capacity constraints, we've certainly heard that. Um, expectation management, just coming back to this, uh, our congressional delegation wants to know why the money hasn't already been spent. And we say, well, you know, hey, you know, DOE is doing their best. They're, they're cranking through their stuff and we're already getting questions about IRA and I just sort of chuckle saying, <laughs> whoa, hold, slow down. We're, we're trying to still work on IIJA. Similarly, um, we have some ex expectations to manage on the part of uh, advocacy organizations. Uh, you know, we were getting these very well thought out uh, letters uh, and, and suggestions for how we use our state energy plan uh, 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 bump uh, and, and how we put that to use. And our response had to be, hey, we're just, we're just trying to keep the lights on in our office uh, with some of this money. You know, thank you very much. Um, so that's, that's a trick. And then I think there are the over the horizon challenges, and this is just to finish it up. Um, we all know about the workforce challenges. We all know about the supply chain challenges. But from where I sit, we haven't fully entered that world where those challenges uh, begin to manifest. Um, you know, we're already preparing in the 40101D context of having to be flexible in terms of um, our subgrants out to uh, providers about, okay, you know, if you can't get you know, the materials that you need, then do we push it out another quarter for your you know, project completion? So I think you know, that, um, that chapter has yet to really begin on the ground and, and we're really gonna need everyone's help uh, in that. So you know, I think just to wrap this up, I would say, uh, similar to what I said yesterday, we need uh, partnership, we need engagement, we need help. Expectation management is we're going to get the money, we're going to spend the money, we're going to do good things. Uh, you know, when I go brief um, our delegation on what we're doing, I want to be able to show that we've got pathways to success. And it's the partners in the room that can say, hey, here's an opportunity for success. We're, we're ready, we're hungry. The state energy offices uh, want to work with as many people as possible to make sure that at the end of the day, we can say that this IIJ experience was a success and we can point to uh, uh, anecdotal evidence uh, as to uh, that success. Thanks, David. So questions for our uh, state stakeholders. Marguerite. Thank you. Um, Marguerite Berenger here uh, with Landis and Gear. I'm curious, when is an appropriate time to start engaging with governors, state energy offices, and commissioners, right? Because, and I understand it's going to be different for each project, um, but I've heard a little bit of different advice. Some folks say, you know, come to us ahead of time, tell us what you're looking for, we'll pair you with the right utility, community, et cetera. I've heard other folks say, you know, come to us more with your concept paper. So I'd be curious just to know at what phase you'd like to be communicated with or, you know, the people you work with would like to be talked to. Sure. Um, I think it's a, a, a very important question. Um, and at the risk of oversimplifying, I'd say um, as soon as you can, uh, which probably isn't the answer that you're necessarily looking for. And I think how exactly that engagement will or you know should look may vary by state or by agency but generally speaking um, it's worth building the relationships now it's worth you know these projects are all moving they're all you know overlapped 
or Venn diagram together. So even if the type of information that they're looking for, you know, a specific concept paper or idea, that might vary by program, that might vary by agency or by state, at least laying that groundwork now to build the relationships, get to know who it is that the governor's office wants you to engage with. Is it at the agency level? Is it the infrastructure coordinator? Is it somebody else so that when the right time comes, you're not trying to look through a phone book and figure out who that is, I think would be really valuable. So um, at the very least, again, it's laying that groundwork, um, figuring out who you need to know, figuring out when and how they want to engage. Um, and then I think that should help with the answer. But I'll also defer to my colleagues working on the ground at the states if, if you have anything else well, you'd I, want I, to add. I could not agree more. Now, now is the time, if you're selling a product or service, uh, and it would be associated with an application that will be presented to DOE. Let the people in, at the PSC know, let the people at the governor's office know it's not never too early to start that relationship rather than be cautious and be courteous and wait six months and by, by then um, that time has passed. I'm going to go with a very helpful answer. Uh, it depends. Um, <laughs> Which is in stark contrast to my appeal just now that you know we need everyone, uh, all hands on deck, to come and bring um, uh, their 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 engagement and, and bring it now. Um, I would I would agree with what's been said, and I can actually cite a recent example, which I think was a, a very um, appropriate way to do it. Um, uh, there's one energy company uh, that recently um, filed uh, comments in our uh, commission's docket that's open on all the spending. Uh, in support of a specific uh, technology in which they feel they have a competitive advantage. Um, and then they appropriately uh, flagged uh, that filing uh, for our office. And so it's note to self, it's on, it's on me to make sure that uh, we, we take a look at that and, and, and respond to it. And so that was a really good example of a, uh, of a very, um, you know, company-specific engagement. I think to the extent, and this is why, you know, grid-wise, this is a perfect forum for this sort of um, uh, conversation, to the extent that it's not so much, um, you know, companies differentiating uh, uh, in the marketplace and it's an industry-wide uh, topic, the extent that that can be aggregated uh, across multiple companies I think is incredibly helpful. Uh, and so there again, it depends on where you are in the process, it depends on what information it is that you're trying to um, uh, to advance. Thanks. Other questions? <laughs> I would also note that we have going up on our website pretty soon uh, an RFI, sort of a general RFI to say, because we're recognizing that this is starting to come and we need a way to organize this information. So we're actually trying to come up with a streamlined process to accept that information. And I think you're going to see a number of the states um, and look into the Kirsten. Uh, probably take that approach where they're trying to organize the communication that's coming in that is valuable but is a lot. All right, thank you. Um, I'm really glad I was able to be here for this. That was a great, great discussion and lineup. Um, I'm Sue Gander with the World Resources Institute, and I wanted to ask a question. Um, it's probably more relevant a few months and years from now, and it may be more directed to the, the federal folks here, but interested in anyone has ideas, but given all this money that's going out and all the exciting projects that I know, you know, we're all looking forward to, um, is there already a discussion of more of a, dare I say it, kind of one-stop shop where we could learn, um, you know, as a researcher and, and someone involved in, you know, wanting to learn from the experiences, but others might have this interest too, like we can learn from, you know, what's being awarded. I don't know if this is kind of a, more of a, White House, you know, Mitch Landrew kind of thing, but just just curious if, you, if you've even had a chance to think about that or if there's anything that's already anticipated around that and just maybe what we might um, might be able to take advantage of. Yes, this is a frequent suggestion uh, that we get. So I will say within the grid deployment office, what we've tried to do as a part of that is first start with just a web page where you can see the specific opportunities that you're able to apply for and be able to kind of approach it in an accessible way through that. So if you weren't here earlier, that's where I was mentioning our interactive tool to do that. DOE also has on its homepage all of the listing of all of the uh, bipartisan infrastructure law infrastructure opportunities where you can see that. And uh, I believe it's um, 
sorted by uh, deadlines um, as, a, as a part of that too. Um, that said, uh, we are trying to improve that every day because I, I think uh, sometimes the, the way that the web page may be uh, oriented uh, could definitely be more accessible on that. So we are having, I think there's a weekly call that I participate on to uh, talk about these ideas and get feedback from forums like this and, and find opportunities like that. But to your point on, we're just talking about DOE, how does that coordinate with the Agriculture Department, Commerce, EPA, uh, uh, many other agencies uh, as a part of that, that would definitely fall much more within the White House purview on that. And I do know that they're trying to work on opportunities for that as well. So I would uh, have to defer to the, the infrastructure coordinating team there. I think that we're gonna um, give uh, Mona and Mark a chance to talk a little bit about what our members are doing in, in reacting to what you heard today. So do you want, are we gonna give them the microphone? What, how would, you might. Oh, you're right. All right. Uh, well, first, I was going to just make sure that as a fellow, uh, as an attorney, I don't get in any, Dylan, in any issues by discussing specifics of uh, grip pa concept papers. So, how do you want? Can no, I speak I, generally? I, yeah, no, I can listen. I just can't. I okay, got it. Can't applaud. Please, please don't look at me and ask me to respond. <laughs> 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 yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah, we're not FERC, so it's okay. Yeah. So. No, I was I was going to thank all the panelists for your perspectives. I think that um, Marguerite's question around how do we approach public entities and speak to them around GRIP and some of these this, these other funding pots. Uh, is a really important one because we ourselves have been discussing, is it a technology, is it a solution, is it a partnership with other entities in your state? Uh, because we don't wanna just talk at a high level, right? We wanna be more specific. Um, so that's one takeaway that we have is how do we come back better with state and local entities and think about that discussion. Um, I will just share that uh, around GRIP in particular, uh, there is a lot of interest uh, in partnering with tribes, territories, rural co-ops, public power. Uh, the small utility set aside that's there, I think people are trying to look at that and, and think about what they can do. Uh, but the challenges are, uh, I, I've heard from other members of Gridwise that uh, some of the challenges are just uh, in within a partnership, which partner is going to be the lead applicant because if you are the lead applicant, you are taking on more of the administrative burden of the application. Uh, and often you have to go through FedConnect, right? And so you have to work within your organization around, okay, do I work with legal? Do I work with our federal business division? So it's also a question of within organizations, how they tackle something like that. Um, one thing that is optimistic is that several of the folks that we've talked to here at Gridwise really want to do concept papers. Like, so the appetite is there. Uh, and I've gotten different people today telling me, do we have, still have time to do this, right? I mean, can we, can we push something through in the next 10 days? So I think from just a general perspective, it's not that there isn't you know, the desire to do it. It's just looking at that administrative burden. Um, I, will, I will share a range of numbers. Uh, I believe that depending on the type of grant company that you utilize, it can be anywhere from $25,000 to $65,000 per application. That's if you hire someone externally, right, to put together um, a concept plus full application. So then an entity is thinking about, okay, we got $60,000, now we gotta think about 50% match. Who's gonna cover that? Where is it gonna come from? So, you know, within the business community, you are gonna look at it through like, what are the numbers and then what is the, where is the match coming in from the government, right? Um, once the grant is awarded. Um, I'm trying to think if there's anything, uh, any other challenges I can share that would be useful to hear. Um, I do think that we need better interfacing with tri the tribal community. That's one, I feel like, uh, and Director Bobsey and we were on a panel in a Grid Forward where there was someone who represented a tribe from NREL, but that was like the only time in the past year within IJA that we had heard from the tribal community. So I think going forward, it would be useful for us to try to figure out how to make more of those inroads or bring more of those panelists to some of these functions. Okay, that's it for now. <laughs> I have more thoughts. 
Right. But with that, I will turn it over to my fellow industry colleague. Sure thing. Do you want to pause for questions now, or should I jump in? No, no, just jump in. All right. So I'm going to speak about a recent um, experience that uh, we at National Grid had. Um, we applied for um, what, the middle mile opportunity, which, as uh, Kristen mentioned, is under broadband. And a year ago, I really didn't know anything about middle mile or broadband. I'm a, I'm a grid mod person, a protection control, power engineer. But everything today is interconnected in the utility. We've heard a lot about uh, distributed, uh, distribution system operation, um, DERMs, things like that. We need communication assets. Upstate New York right now, almost 40% of our substations lack SCADA connectivity. Um, these are a lot of very rural areas. Um, but we started looking at the maps of where these substations are that lack connectivity. There's a lot of unserved communities there as well. So back in April or so, we started looking at where is the overlap between unserved communities, unserved operational assets, and other communication needs. Uh, for example, um, I believe it was Carl mentioned a comment about um, new ways of protecting and controlling our system. We're installing a battery energy storage system in the Adirondacks. We can't install that. Be oh, we would. We, didn't have, we couldn't protect it with conventional protection means because of the lack of inertia there. So we needed to install communications for the protection. So the line differential schemes, which required 60 miles of new fiber, which would have been $30 million based on our estimates. That's the same path where there's unserved homes. So we started looking, we started at the time partner, looking at potential partners. In that area, there's a, there's a state agency, the Development Authority of the North Country. They own a 2,000 mile open access fiber network. We found another partner, um, a 501c3 nonprofit that was formed by, between Corning Inc. and the southern tier of New York counties to provide um, open access middle mile to state uh, and public institutions. We ended up partnering with them as well. As we went through this partnership discussion, we started calling, um, we looked at the, the uh, St. Regis Mohawk Nation. They had their own ISP there that provide internet service around their, the reservation and that, the tribal entity. Um, they needed additional middle mile access as well. Once again, a lot of unserved communities. It was kind of interesting the number of potential partners out there. Um, the more and more we got into this process. Um, once again, in April, we didn't know where to even start with this. Um, <clears throat> as we went through this, though, we definitely learned, I see state, local, tribal, all these partners were out there. It was a challenge, though, finding them. Um, one of the biggest helps, but also the biggest opportunities for improvement was within the state offices themselves. And I'd love to get thoughts as we pause. How do, how do we educate and bring these different industries together? Because in New York, there's the Connect All office. I think it's a fairly developed broadband office. And the first time I called them and said I was from National Grid looking at this funding, they're saying, why haven't you looked at this before? We just went through several hundred million dollars of funding opportunities. We've never heard from any utilities on this. Uh, but yet, all the broadband's being hung in our polls, right? So Make Ready has been a barrier to entry for some of these broadband communities, even though the utilities need broadband and it needs access in these areas as well. So it's, been a, it's, it's been quite the journey over the last nine months to kind of pull this together. It's been fun, learned a ton. Um, and ultimately, I think at the end of the day, we, we, this is a Venn diagram of benefits. The benefits for the electric users, the broadband users, which are two of the same, so as well as the state's renewable energy targets. And we're really kind of hitting the middle of this Venn diagram and getting benefits for all. Um, that said, I think we have a really, really awesome proposals that we submitted, but because this was new for us and new for a lot of the industry, I, I'm not sure if we got everything we could have got. And as we look at BEAD and the next round of opportunities here, I'm kind of curious on thoughts from the panelists. How do, we, how do we maximize those opportunities ahead of time? How do we really make sure that the broadband offices are talking, or the broadband folks within the PSC are talking to the power folks within the PSC. So when I, when I have to present a life cycle cost analysis, BCA, for why we're using electric rate pair of money to do this, um, I can get the right um, analysis from the, um, uh, the internet users there as well. Um, this is just new for us. It's really challenging to kind of navigate this. And we don't want to leave any money on the table like Jason mentioned. Um, but it is, it is challenging sometimes to, to pull this together very quickly, um, especially if it's something we're not, we're not really deep into day to day. And I, I should let the panelists know that the very first uh, panel discussion, the fireside chat that we had uh, yesterday morning to kick uh, off Grid Connects was about uh, the, the convergence of telecom and um, utility communication networks and, and the, the, what's becoming a foundational 
part of a modern grid is this is uh, the communicate the broadband communication network. And so um, it, this isn't it, this is not as specific a question as it may seem in terms of one particular project. It really is something that we have been focusing on. Is that you know we and we were huge proponents of the middle mile um, language. In fact, we kind of fed it to people in Congress. And so how we marry that money and the economic development potential for that as part of grid projects is enormous. So um, when I think about some of the things that GridWise can do to help in this space, uh, shining a light on, you know, Kirsten, you said you weren't a broadband expert. I'm not a broadband expert either, but we have broadband experts. And we have people at the beginning stages of upgrading their utility communication networks. And we have um, we have companies that are providing the 5G for the wireless part of it. So there's a, there's a range of things when I think about what we can do to help inform your work around the broadband piece. That's just one of the things that I wrote down. Um, but I want to see if, do you guys have other perspectives that you wanted to deliver from Gridwise? Um, I, I'm interested in any type of forums that you know about where people can meet to meet, to find partners. Like, yeah. as Mark was just saying, everybody has the appetite, but sometimes locating the right partner can be difficult. I mean, you can obviously look at yeah. your existing customer base. You can think about your current state relationships, but there may be someone who you would be really well matched for. So it might be interesting um, to think about where there's a good exchange, um, aside from these wonderful conferences that, you know, that we could have. I don't know if they would be facilitated federally or by the state. Um, but I think that's something that people would be really interested in attending, right? And uh, I don't know, I, maybe I'll ask Anne if you want to share anything else just from some of the, the GRIP discussions we've had or anything like that. Yeah. How to be a matchmaker. Yeah. <laughs> How to be a matchmaker. Yeah. 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 Private, private partnership. Yeah. Instead of yeah. calling everyone, right, you know, right. reaching out. It, a reaction from from this side. That's really hard, but but there's some different options. One one of which is to work with aggregators. Uh, in the Northwest, there's a group called Northwest Public Power Association, and they have a blend of co-ops and munis. Uh, and if you go to them, they can identify if it's a broadband issue that may be linked to uh, regional re uh, energy storage for resilience hardening, how you communi co communicate across different network microgrids. They could probably identify a handful. There's Energy Northwest in the Northwest that aggregates for its uh, 20 owners. Velco uh, has 18 distribution companies, and if someone were to approach a Velco, they could maybe identify here are three of those distribution companies might, that might be interested in issue X. Yeah. So you're just going to have to go local and regional, mm -hmm. talk to the regional planning entities, some of the regional public power entities. In the Washington State, there's a group of uh, that represents the 29 tribes. And so uh, if you want to talk to the tribes that are on the coast and dealing with climate change issues around water inundation, mm -hmm. they can tell you the five tribes that are dealing with that right now. So that, that it's going to be... Mm -hmm. Different sizes that you got to just find those aggregators. I would just add on, on the broadband um, energy connection. I think one of the things we're seeing is such a convergence of all these yes. sectors, and I yep. think it's challenging for the state governments to respond because they are still in that those kind of silos, and the federal yep. government yep. is in those silos because you just have to organize yourself somehow, and that is obviously mirroring what you know how the industry has been decades yep. and decades. Um, but elevating those kind of connections to us, to the states, to the federal government, to show here in New York, this is what happened. Those yep. were the challenges. This is what, what went really well. This is what didn't go well. Um, and just learning from those experiences and then finding out how that is happening in other states. And so they don't have to repeat the same mistakes, right? If New York went through it or you went through it in yep. New York, then let's take that as a case study and see how we can apply that in other states. And so just, that's just so helpful to us, and, and then maybe I'll become a broadband expert after all. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that's spot on, and on broadband in particular. Um, so we started to convene the, uh, at NGO, we started to convene the state broadband office directors at the beginning of the pandemic. Um, and, and I think we were among the first groups to do that. There really isn't sort of an equivalent state association for broadband office directors in part because up until you know, a few years ago, there really weren't state broadband offices, right? Or in many cases, they were offices of one. 
Um, and so, and really up until last year, up until all, a lot of the um, recovery funding and a lot of, you know, stimulus funding and now IJ funding started coming to the states, they, you know, those that did exist weren't necessarily grant making organizations. Um, and so there has been a lot that the states have been figuring out, frankly, in that space. It's, um, so fully agree, it's a tough area to navigate and I think there are kind of learning curves throughout. So I, I wholeheartedly agree with Kirsten that as you hear about, you know, as you're working on that, you know, pass that feedback on to the states, um, certainly to state associations like ours, and we're doing our best to, um, you know, convene those broadband office directors. We're working closely with NASIO on a very regular basis on a wide range of issues, and, and Nehru for that matter as well for the utility commissioners. And so should there be an opportunity or need to kind of bring, convene folks together at maybe the higher level, the state association level, or with our federal partners at DOE and at um, Commerce and NTIA, I think we, you know, we're all ears for where those opportunities lie. So very much appreciate the input. Yeah, so I'm, I'm mindful of the time and that um, everybody's been sitting in this room for two days and two hours straight now. And what, what I hear, I, this was a fabulous conversation, so thank you very much to both, both sides and to the panelists for, for sitting in front of us for two hours. Um, I, I hear a number of things that can inform what Gridwise does over the next couple of years. The first is, um, is how we use the grid modernization index going forward to provide you with some greater insights into metrics um, and also to provide a baseline for the conditions across this, the country now and look at how this massive infusion of funding actually does change things. So we're doing um, the grid modernization index a little differently this time around. We put out a, a framework that has all these questions and then we're gonna do a big data collection at which point I think what we'll do is make sure that we've, we're asking the questions that deliver metrics. So there's not yes and no answers, but like real metrics that you can use. So that's one thing. Um, the second thing is um, it seems like uh, on broadband, but probably on a some other topics that we can talk further about that um, are convenings. We, we can't go state by state but we can do convenings with our industry experts, and we did a convening with Ashto, Nehru, and Nazio um, on near-term grid investments for transportation electrification. We can do more of those things, and we can do um, we can build out reports like the one we did on transportation electrification. We're doing one on four quarter 22-22 on the technologies that are necessary to help you accomplish your state goals so that when people come to you with um, projects, proposals, you can kind of have a, you know, a, a document that explains why they want to do the technologies, what the grid services and functions are, how you get to the policy goals from deploying, you know, allowing those investments. So that's another thing. Uh, figuring out some way to do some sort of forum for partnerships, I think, is something we could do with both the end groups and other groups in terms of bringing people together specifically for that purpose. We certainly can disseminate um, information on all of your programs, whether it's at the state level or at the federal level to all of our members and the footprint for our members it touches just about every state, whether it's from the vendor perspective or the utility footprint perspective or the RTOs that are our members, the consulting companies. So please look to us as a dissemination um, vessel as well as a resource for information. Um, I think that providing some um, insights to you on supply chain timelines that we're hearing from our members would be potentially very useful. Uh, and that could be an ongoing thing because we expect that those timelines change and hopefully shorten. Um, there are some of our members that are working on project templates and that are working on kind of um, plug and play opportunities so that, you know, particularly for small and medium utilities, they can, you know, um, look at that plug and play as something that they can just build into a project proposal so we can encourage and identify for all of you when we know one of our members has one of those plug and play or very replicable um, project applications. Um, I think there's probably more we can do, but with our limited, I, I'm going to stop there and not make more work for myself, but I think those are some things that we already had in the works potentially that actually we could just by letting you know we're doing them actually could, could be very helpful. So any, anything else on our end for what Gridwise could be doing to, to help this process? 
Well, we have gone over by two minutes, but I really, uh, this was incredibly helpful for us. As we mentioned, we're doing our strategic plan for the next three years, and I feel like we just kind of put, put a lot of flesh on the bones of what we presented early today in the member meeting. So I want to thank um, everybody, and, and um, really, this is, this is not the end. Well, for some of us, it might be the end. <laughs> David and I go way back. <laughs> <laughs> but the, the, we, we hope that this is a long relationship for the next few years that we can work together. So I really appreciate everybody, and thank you so much for being part of Grid Connects 2022.